In the last set of videos, we covered a good bit about how we might measure the extent of eutrophication in a lake or lentic system. Now, there are other elements to this concept of eutrophication that we need to consider, and not just how do we measure it, but maybe how do we control it, or how do we at least slow it down. So this slide, entitled Controlling Cultural Eutrophication, discusses some of the steps that we might take. Now, cultural eutrophication is sometimes also called anthropogenic eutrophication, meaning its origins are of human nature. There is natural eutrophication that's happening all the time. Our sediments have nutrients in them. The soils that are west of Lexington and near to Bowling Green, the soils there are known to have higher amounts of phosphorus in some areas of the United States. So natural eutrophication still happens, but we can engage in the use of best management practices or BMPs to slow down the amount of sediment that runs off and even slow down runoff off of agriculturally rich uh, fields. One thing that sometimes happens is areas where we have row crop agriculture, like we might be growing corn or soybeans or whatever, those same areas may also be near areas where they also raise a lot of livestock. So historically, you would take the animal manure and then you could land apply it. In the Midwest, in the Upper South, this would happen during the time of the year when the fields may freeze. So you could apply a lot of manure during that time of the year and then theoretically there would be a lot of nutrients, a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus for the crops. The problem is when it thaws out and it rains and spring rains happen and there's not a lot of vegetation on the ground, a lot of those nutrients run off. And decades or maybe even a century of this practice has really left these soils already with enough fertilizer, enough already in them. So for controlling cultural or anthropogenic eutrophication, we should take efforts to engage in best management practices that reduce or slow down the amount of water that runs off these fields, and we ought to discourage the over-application of fertilizers. Some fields, to dry them out more quickly, they've ran over generations clay pipe, perforated pipe, or trenches to help dry them out more quickly. That process, although it's good for the equipment, it does make the water run to the, you know, off the fields to the streams, which run to the lakes, much more swiftly. So we want the water to have more time to interact with the environment, with the soil microbes, with the plants, and everything else. So these are some practices that we can engage in that will help reduce cultural eutrophication. We should also try to avoid applying manure when the ground is frozen. We know that most of the nutrients are going to run off and not actually make it in the ground. We should also focus not only on just agriculture, but in areas of the United States where we've got sewer overflows happening, whether they be combined, sanit combined sewer overflows or sanitary sewer overflows. We should also work with reducing the amount of septic systems that are failing and running off. All those things. Controlling waterfowl populations, not feeding, you know, waterfowl trash or garbage or, you know, so discouraging people from feeding ducks and other wildlife that might also impair our lakes. We should look at diverting wastewater. So we should not be having our wastewater run directly into lakes. So we want our wastewater to go in the flowing bodies of water. So those are just a few things that we can do to control cultural eutrophication. You're gonna watch a video on Grand Lake St. Mary's or Grand Lake and learn from them on how they're trying to make improvements on that lake that has been heavily impaired by decades of eutrophication.